Okay, so I've been looking forward to doing this lecture where I can explain what conics are from a projective viewpoint in a way that's really quite easy to digest. And the key to this, it actually turns out, is Pascal's theorem. So let's once again recall this Pascal's theorem. I mean, it is a very important result which crops up all over the place. So the result says that if you have a circle and then you do six lines around the outside of that circle and you look at the kind of hexagonal shape which is generated by having these points uh, having adjacent points linked with lines well that will give you a hexagon um, and what Pascal's result says amongst many other things is that if you do this for an ellipse or a circle or even for a more exotic thing like a, a parabola or a hyperbola any kind of conic then you can always construct what's known now as the Pascal line. And the Pascal line is basically the thing that you get by, if you join any opposite sides of this, of this um, hexagon here. So what are some opposite sides? Well, if these two have two each, so they're opposite vertices. So these must be opposite sides, and they meet here. That's one. Now if we carry on round, look at this side. What's the opposite to this side? There we go. And I imagine that the last one is way up here. If we just press this and this, we should probably pick it up. Okay, a slight adjust day so that... There we are. Okay, now we can see everything. And as Pascal said would happen... We find these three newly generated line uh, points are collinear on a straight line. Now, as I say, this also works for conics. Also works if you swap around the order of the points remarkably. You always get this Pascal line still appearing. But the thing which I neglected to mention last time, which is of huge importance, is that this result has a converse, which is equally, if not more, important. So, the question is, what happens if you six points are not starting on a circle? What happens if you just start them any, in any old places around the plane and give them a cyclic ordering and then draw the lines as if you're making a hexagon? And then, once you've got your hexagon, you can link your opposite vertices, since the composite of... Sorry, you can link your opposite edges, since the concept of opposite edges will come in once you give your elements a cyclic order. And so you can do all of this construction. The question is, what are you left with? And the answer is, Pascal's answer is, you will end up with a line, if and only if, your original six points were six points of a conic. So let me just say that again, in a different way. Pas basically Pascal's result gives us a kind of litmus test as to whether six points lie on a conic or not. If they do, then Doing this Pascal procedure with them will yield a straight line. If they don't, 
then doing this Pascal procedure will yield three points which are not in a straight line. And the thing is with this, not only is it a good test for, you know, everyday kind of usage, um, if you encounter questionable hexagons every day, but it also basically helps us to find this really simple definition of a conic. Okay, so now we finally come to what I think is one of my favorite results of projective geometry because this really um, explains in my mind at least what a conic is in a way that I can actually understand like I always find these definitions involving slicing cones or quadratics or even the things about directrix and such I find them quite it's not that I don't understand them it's that I they don't really I don't understand them at a very deep level, but not simple enough. But this is a proper simple way to think about what conics are. Basically, a conic is a line which goes through five given points. That's all it is. Take five given points, um, and we would just have the restriction that no three line no three points can be on a straight line. And now with those points, a conic is defined. How? Well, we can go like this. Take this point here. And we draw three lines out of it. And take this point here and do similar. Now, this defines these two extra lines, which I shall colour in orange. Whoops, that's the wrong one. Live constructions today. So we can colour these two newly emergent lines in orange. And let's also join our initial two points. Oh, in fact, that's not necessary. Okay, so we've got two extra lines being generated. Also, an extra point has been generated. Um, up here. Just because of the nature of the thing. And now it turns out that we basically will have all the things we need to get a sort of um, conic as as Pascal's theorem implies should come into existence. So what we do is we just draw any line that we like from this point here onto this orange line and then we just find the perspective of where that place meets that orange line with respect to this green point here which as we say has already come about And this will give us a point on the other side. In fact, it will give us a point way over here, meeting this other orange line.
Now here's the thing. We just need to do two extra lines. Going back to those two points that we drew at the beginning. Let's put a red point between these two purple lines that have been produced. So that would be there. Now hopefully you can see so those initial five points defined the orange lines and the green point and the only extra choice we appeared to have was how to draw this extra purple line here. However, if we just look at the space of all purple lines that we could have drawn, we'll see that that actually gives us a conic. So we'll put the trace on this red point. Let's look at all the different ways we could have picked this, this point here on the right. That was the only choice we had, was to, as to how to pick this point along this line. So we'll look at our space of choices, and what do they give us? Ah, look at that, they give us an ellipse. So there we have it. And we can see why we get an ellipse as well, or why we get a conic. We get a conic because we have six points, and this is the Pascal's line of these six points. And therefore, Pascal's theorem says that these six points must lie on a conic. So it's almost a corollary of it, well it is a corollary of Pascal's theorem really that um, any five points defines a conic and if we change the order of the points we can get different kinds of conics out of this so now I've changed around the order of these initial five, uh, five points again and I've actually just highlighted the special sort of pivot pivoting uh, point and so as you move this it shifts the green point so I shift the red point and uh, I've got what's called a trace function on or ghosting function so that on GeoGebra it shows all the pre-images of where this point's been so basically as I move this purple point you remember in the construction we start with five points and then everything every decision is forced except one decision which is about um, we had that orange line on the right and we could decide um, how high up we wanted to join it to. So we made the point where we join it to purple. That was our only variable. And you can see that as we vary it, it changes the position of that red point um, across all these different places and essentially sweeps out a, well, a hyperbola in this case. So we've just shown, we've just used Pascal's theorem to show that, well, well to argue that um, five points, the position, um, saying that a curve passes through five points defines that curve as a conic and defines it completely. Um, now, we can do the dual of that result since it's projective geometry. So it turns out that if you draw five lines, any five lines, and you say, well, each of these lines are going to be meeting the curve at a tangent to the curve, in other words, just touching the curve, then that, again, uniquely defines what kind of conic that curve is and what shape it will have. And the dual of this, this is the dual of the original statement, and the proof of it can basically be achieved dualistically using Brajon's theorem, which is the dual of Pascal's theorem. So let's just recall Brajon's theorem. I'll just do it for the simple case for the circle. So if we draw a circle, let's just hide that point. Now, put six points around the outside of the circle, as we like. Now 
But just imagine... Well, no, in fact, forget that. Let's just carry on. Uh, and so... Now what we want to do is draw a tangent to the circle at each of those points. Let's find where consecutive lines on our hexagon meet. So, those two are consecutive. They meet here. These two meet here. Okay then, now all we have to do is link these opposite vertices of this hexagon and that should give us our brush on point. And there we have it. Now just like I was saying with Pascal's theorem, this is not the full story. So again, this is not the full story. It is true that the f once these six lines, which meet this conic, are defined, that leads to the um, the crystallization of this Brachon point that's predefined, predetermined by where the six lines are meeting the conic. The thing is though, it's not only that, we also have the converse. We have that if we have any five, sorry, any six lines, then the point which they generate in this manner by thinking of them um, giving, by thinking of them as ordered and creating a hexagon and then linking opposite vertices of a hexagon. Now, that's only going to result in a point. In other words, those three last purple lines you draw are only going to make a point when the initial six lines you began with were all tangent to points on a conic. If they were not tangent to lines on a conic, if they were just randomly chosen lines, then you won't have this property that they end up defining a single point. So, um, both Pascal's result and Brachon's result have a converse, and that converse essentially allows us to look at a configuration of points or lines, respectively, and tell us, are those objects on a conic, or are they not? And so, basically, the um, upshot of this is that if you draw five lines, that you defines a unique conic. And basically, I'll leave that as an exercise to you.